Hello and welcome to a Cook's Tour and welcome to you thirsty folks who have tuned in for the Cocktail and Wine Pairing Masterclass. I'm thrilled to have Johan Svensson from Drinks Fusion and Tim Jackson, Master of Wine from Amethyst, with me to refresh us before our trip to the Middle East begins. Johan, welcome back for the season finale. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure. Lovely to have you here and lovely of you to bring what looks like a sort of a, a shimmering jewel of a cocktail for us to have this evening. In fact, it looks like we've taken a trip to a, a perfumery in a department <laughs> store with a little spritz to go alongside. Yes, indeed, indeed. Um, what are you treating us to? So, we, today we're doing a twist on a classic Gimlet. Aha. And uh, Gimlet is um, dead back to the sort of uh, 1950s mm -hmm. uh, and uh, using lime cordial. Uh, and the cordial uh, was invented in the um, 17th century in the Navy to, you know, to preserve um, citrus fruits. So it's very good against uh, scurvy. I see. And, uh, but the actual original gimlet is sort of was gin and lime cordial. <laughs> That's, it. <laughs> That's it. Doesn't sound terrible. No, well, well, no, I mean, it, so it, it can be made fairly nice as well that way, but um, it has since evolved a lot. So this is uh, very, very much uh, a, a take on that and very different in a way, but it still has a cordial. So I made a cordial uh, of lemons mm -hmm. and pomegranate and a little bit of uh, orange zest and cardamom and wonderful spices mm -hmm. like that and we're mixing that together with a little bit of fresh citrus and the fantastic rose liqueur from uh, Van Vies in Holland which is distilled from seven different types of roses and it's absolutely wow. beautiful and uh, the see if I can pronounce it uh, Mata, Mataroa uh, Mediterranean gin, which uses a lot of Middle Eastern uh, botanicals. How interesting. So really should be quite a, a flavor journey. All about fragrance, all about really, really delightful aromas. Yeah, good. And um, should we just get to it? No time like the present, Joe. Yeah, exactly. So, I'm so you can do this. I really recommend this to be shaken very hard and very cold, right? So okay. you could use, just as we talked about previously, a jam jar or a container with any kind of um, way of sort of straining off the ice. But if you've got a cocktail shaker at home, then do grab it. You can also just stir it on a bit of ice or serve it chilled, mm -hmm. but I do recommend giving it a good old shake. Good. So we're going to start with plenty of ice. You want to use quite a lot of ice because otherwise you will dilute it too much. So I'm going to go all the way like that. And it also has a little melon pistachio in it, which is, uh, helps to give that fantastic, slightly, that particular colour becomes the, 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 the nuts gives that. So it's a pistachio, uh, pistachio that yes, it does. Extraordinary. So. But the colour is something else. I know. Okay, so what are you, how much are you pouring in? Well, sort of? it's about sort of 80, 70 mil, uh, 80 per serve. Yeah. Make sure we add a little bit of extra for us there, we might need it. Um, <laughs> and um, a good shake. So it should be nice and cold. Oh, Johan, you had your shake face on that. I know, I did a bit. Wow. <laughs> now we're going to get really fancy with this. You don't have to do this at home, but it's uh, uh, quite nice with maybe a small ice cube. Mm -hmm. So a little twist on a straight up drink. You could just do it regular straight up, but let's uh, make it a little bit special. And also same thing here, you can see the ice cubes are clear because they're frozen very slowly. And choice of glass? Choice of glass, I'd use the champagne cube here. <clears throat> yeah. uh, sort of or you could use a, a small martini glass or something like that. You shouldn't have, don't make the drink too big because it is an intense drink. It's all about concentration of flavor and, and really refreshing. So don't take a massive champagne coupe and fill it up because I just think it will warm up a bit, which isn't very pleasant. That is a beautiful thing. Look at that. I don't think we're getting it's, there. It's like a sort of a, a, a Turkish delight color. <laughs> it um, is a bit. I'm, I'm, I'm terrified that this is going to uh, whistle down my throat. Well, we shall find out, hopefully. Um, it should taste as good as it looks. Yeah. So then we can garnish it a little bit. 
So maybe what a leaf. Garnishing with? That's a pineapple sage leaf, and this okay. is a nasturtium. So a little bit of a mix. Then a calendula, pressed calendula flower. And do you press these flowers? They're all hand pressed. Yeah. So this is something that folks can do at home if they yeah, have if time you, the patients. My mother taught me how to do it many oh. years ago when I was a... Mrs. Spencer. Yes, we were sort of forced to go out and pick flowers and press them mm. and learn the Latin names, which I can't remember. Oh, well, look um, what you know, <laughs> pressing flowers and making cocktails. Exactly, exactly. But hey, you know, it's, um, it found, it's found its usage, that's for sure. Little finger out? Uh, little finger out. <laughs> so um, here you have a rose tincture, yep. which uh, you spray a little bit over them, like that, and it should, you should get an absolutely wonderful aroma. So it's all about the Mediterranean flavors. Love it. Love, um, love it. Okay. So go ahead. I will do. Thank you. Oh, I can smell the rose from here. Oh, I tell you, it's lovely. It's really, it's like, it's just sort of, in, it invites you in. Mm. And what an invitation. It's and delicious. Brilliant. Ooh. And it's nice with, um, do straight up drinks with small ice cubes. It's a little twist you can do, if you do daiquiris, margaritas or something. It's a little bit of a halfway uh, house between on the rocks and straight up. I absolutely love it. Now, before you disappear, tell us, um, what do you think is going to be the hot cocktail this summer? I think classic drinks like gimlet, stackeries, by using um, seasonal ingredients, like forage ingredients and things in your garden and stuff like that, it will really be on trend. And I mean, the, the classic cocktails never really go away. That's why they're classics. But I think using um, uh, uh, seasonal produce and things that grows around you is a really important thing. Now, pomegranates doesn't naturally grow around you, but but even the, you know the the I, th I think the the, uh, the that natural flavours and and the simplicity of 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 it will will become a really more feature in drinks. And pressing your own flowers. And pressing your, your own flowers, indeed, or drying them. Good, um, Johan. Thank you as ever. Thank you for joining you. us. It's been a pleasure. Tour. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Um, great. Well, thank you to Johan. And now we're going to move on to the wine segment. And um, I'm delighted to welcome, first time to a Cook's Tour, Tim Jackson from Amethyst. Hi, Tim. Hi. How are you? Very good, thanks. Very good. Very good. Happy to be here. Well, very pleased that you are here because you have brought with your, your, yourself two really interesting wines. Um, from where? These are, these are from Lebanon. Mm. Um, so, you know, for me with Middle Eastern food, the, the first place I think about for the food is Lebanese cuisine. I think yeah. in the UK we've seen a lot of, of lovely, uh, really vibrant Lebanese cuisine, but you might not necessarily think of Lebanon for wine, but you absolutely should. So in the Middle East, it's, it's the, 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 the heart of, of top quality wine at the moment and actually has a huge history with wine. If, mm. if, you, if, you, if you go there and you find the Temple of Baalbek in the north of the country, the Temple of Baalbek. Temple of Baalbek. <laughs> And it's like Temple of Doom. No, it's a Temple of <laughs> Wonderful Pleasure. It, actually, th th there's a Temple to Bacchus there. So you're talking about thousands of years okay. of winemaking history. And, and in the relatively recent history, of course, it was a French colony. Yep. So you've got huge French influence and a lot of great varieties grown there are French. Um, I think the reason why the country fell off the map a little bit was because, of course, the Civil War uh, in, the, in the 70s uh, and onwards, where a lot of places stopped making wine at all. Mm. Um, but in the 1990s, you saw a real rejuvenation, kind of post-war uh, 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 companies coming into, into the country or Lebanese people coming back and really wanting to make something of the country. Uh, and, and the Bekaa Valley, which is kind of this big central valley that, that runs, it, it's, it's uh, between two sets of mountains that is back from Beirut. So you have to go over the mountains from mm. Beirut and then you end up in the Bekaa. Yeah, the Bekaa is a, a hugely broad, fertile place. Um, it's actually very high up in, uh, in altitude as well, which makes it really good for growing grapes in a hot Mediterranean climate. Um, and, and, you know, a bunch of people went back there in the 90s and, and brought new money um, into making some really interesting wine. And I think the, you know, the country's really thrived since then as, as, as well as it can. And in fact, uh, Chateau Héritage, uh, um, the producer of these two wines, is in exactly that model. Uh, so uh, a, a, a company called uh, Arak Tuma, making Arak, the local, local spirit, decided that they wanted to be kind of getting back into the wine business and, and in 1997 started making wine again and launched the Chateau Hitage brand in, in 2000. So it's a really kind of classic example of the rejuvenation so of Lebanon. Lebanese wine is having a sort of renaissance. If you mm. Very much so, very much so. How exciting. Okay, well, um, I'm feeling thirsty. We should try. We should. Let's yeah, start, let's should. start. And I'm, I'm guessing with the rosé. We should indeed. We should absolutely start with the rosé. Um, so, so this is a rosé du nuit. Uh, it's it's uh, done overnight, hence 
of one night. I was wondering, but what was the meaning behind the label? Was it one yeah. special night when something <laughs> it, all, it all fell from the stars. <laughs> no, uh, so so uh, the way you make rosé wine is you leave uh, the, the, the juice that's about to ferment in contact with the red skins mm. of the grapes, because all the colour is in the skins. And the length of time you leave it changes how deep the colour goes, essentially, but it also changes the flavours. So this had about 12 hours with the skins in contact with the juice before they fermented it and made it into wine. I see. Overnight. One night. So rosé of one night is, is, is uh, Chateau Héritage's uh, uh, pink, done in a relatively pale style for Lebanon. Some mm. of the Lebanese pink wines are actually quite deep and powerful and gutsy. Mm. This is a little more elegant style, so mirroring a little bit Provence and the styles that perhaps we've become accustomed to. Yes, quite shrewd, I would imagine. It is, it is, but it still has a Lebanese twist to it. Okay, so, well, so, let's, so let's, let's try and you can tell me what that twist is. You're transporting me sort of four or five months into the future. <laughs> Absolutely. Into, into, into rosé season. Absolutely. Um, still much rosé in the winter, I imagine not. It depends on the rosé. I mean, the majority obviously is in the summer, but some of these slightly more powerful rosés, richer stars can work actually pretty well in winter. So stars like Tavel from, from southern France and indeed uh, a number of the kind of Lebanese styles. Yeah. But what we have here is a wine that, that's a blend of four different varieties. All of them are from France, but they're from a mixture of places. So you have the main grape varieties, Cabernet Sauvignon, which is the grape of Bordeaux. Uh, yeah, so on the west of France, the Atlantic coast, relatively cool. The other grape varieties are things like Grenache and Carignan, which are from the absolutely Mediterranean hot southern France. Mm. And this mixture of, of varieties from the Rhone Valley and Provence and the Mediterranean with varieties from Bordeaux is something that's really quite unique to, to the history of Lebanese wine. So this is a bit of a reflection of the old world of Lebanese wine, but with a nice modern twist and modern winemaking takes lots of brightness and freshness. And I'm getting a sort of a hint of that sort of, um, I don't know, that sort of red fruit raspberries and... Absolutely. It has a really nice core of fruit, absolutely red uh, raspberries, also a little bit kind of satsuma citrus, so mm. not lemon citrus, but something with a little bit of richness and sweetness on the palate. That's delicious. Very good. And enough weight to carry some quite intense flavours. Yeah, definitely, food. definitely a foodie wine. Mm. Lovely, thank you. Um, and then... You've chosen a red wine. A we have. We have a Syrah. So again, this is uh, uh, the great variety. Syrah is is very much a Fran French Rhone Valley uh, uh, grape variety in both the north and the south. In the northern Rhone, it's it's normally done a hundred percent so on its own. It's the same grape variety as Shiraz in Australia, and it's a very versatile grape variety and one that I think does particularly well in the warm Mediterranean uh, kind of climate of Lebanon. Mm. This is a pure Syrah. So, uh, and it's probably on the spectrum in flavour taste of somewhere between Syrah that you might know from France and, and the Shiraz more powerful style uh, from, from Australia. Uh, it spent six months in oak barrels, so it has uh, a lovely kind of, again, little spicy, uh, almost bacon fat, toasted bacon fat character, which is something that, that Syrah does when it's had a bit of barrel age, a bit of, bit of oak aging. Um, and then it's got a lovely rich intensity of flavour. So if we're thinking about kind of grilled meat dishes and that kind of you know, fried lamb and these kind of flavours mm. that you often get in Mediterranean food, that's what this is for. And it has a lovely peppery spicy kick, which is a classic Syrah flavour. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's taste. Yeah, please do. Well, Sabrina's got a lovely marinated um, sirloin. Mm. It's exactly the dish so, for this. Yeah. Exactly the dish for this. That's going to work, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, a lovely rich colour, look at that. Yeah. I'm going to get my nose in there. Mmm. Mmm. It's got that kind of roasted coffee, grilled meat, kind of aromatic character, and, and, and black pepper is an aroma of, of Syrah. It's literally in the grape itself, and I think you get a bit of that, mm. bit of that here. Oh, yes, sir. That's delicious. Not bad, is it? I might hold on to that bottle and have <laughs> You might have to retaste. Sabrina, Sabrina gets cooking. It's, it's important to retaste continually. Yeah, of course, always. Mmm, I absolutely love that. I could stand here and listen to you, Tim, talk about wine um, for the rest of the evening. Um, but <laughs> You don't have the rest of the well, evening. Well, unfortunately, sadly. unfortunately, we do have um, Sabrina Gayor mm. joining us short mm. for a fantastic Middle Eastern cook-along. So I have to say thank you. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you for picking these excellent wines. Um, and I hope everyone at home enjoys tucking into those now and also save some back mm. 
for your dinner later too. So thank you very much. You're very welcome indeed. And um, everyone at home, we shall see you shortly for the cook along.
Good evening and a warm welcome to a cooked tour. Good evening and a warm welcome to a Cook's Tour and to our final destination of the winter tour, the flavours of the Middle East. My name is Charlie Grant-Peterkin and I'm delighted to be joined on this, our season finale, by the one and only Sabrina Gale. Hello. Hello Sabrina, <laughs> so good to have you on board. So, Sabrina is a British Iranian chef food writer and author of multiple award-winning cookbooks. She runs a hugely successful supper club, Sabrina's Kitchen. Sabrina is a regular on Saturday Kitchen as well as Sunday Brunch and has featured as a guest judge on MasterChef and The Great British Menu. As Nigella Lawson said, Sabrina's Middle Eastern food is all flavor, no fuss, and makes me very, very happy. Yes, I can imagine Nigella <laughs> relishing your food, Sabrina. Well, uh, she's very kind. <laughs> but she certainly was very instrumental in those flavours, making them popular, so I've got a lot to thank her for. Good. OK, so here we are. We're off to the Middle East, um, the season finale, and we're so pleased that you're here. Please, just sort of furnish our minds. Just give us a little bit of sort of texture, paint the picture of the Middle East and the food, the flavours, the culture, and, and what it is that we're going to be sort of getting involved in tonight. So the one thing about the Middle Eastern region, even as a Brit myself, is it just seems like a, a region where everything is quite similar, but actually it's so vast mm. and so wildly diverse that, you know, one country to another, let alone one region to another in different countries, couldn't be more different, different uses of ingredients, different weather conditions and seasons, different practices and traditions. What that makes is this, you know, area with a massive diversity of flavor, a huge melting pot, which is why for me, I wanted to share something that was a little bit more of the tour of the flavors of the Middle East rather than focus on one country. And that's hopefully what we're going to deliver to people today. And we're going to see that journey through the dishes that you're going to be creating. Absolutely, and just showing people how full on flavoured it is, but perhaps it's, it might be a little bit different to what people think Middle Eastern food is. So lots of surprises, lots of flavours, but nothing too aggressive, just all really, really lovely, working together really well. Fabulous, fabulous, great. Well, um, before we kick off, just a tiny little bit of housekeeping for you folks at home. You are welcome to cook along now with Sabrina, or you can sit back, relax, enjoy cocktails, enjoy wine, um, and cook along later um, or indeed tomorrow. So um, the choice is yours. If you do decide to cook along, then there is, of course, the live chat function, and Michael is there to answer any of your questions. Don't forget, you can press the space button to pause um, and then press again to release yourselves. Um, and there is the instruction booklet, so everything is laid out there so you can follow along the method to the madness that will be the next hour or so. Um, and of course, the social handles, um, cook with rocket, um, a cook tour, um, please post all your incredible photographs of your delicious dishes. Um, we would absolutely um, love to see your creations. And also um, tag in Sabrina. Sabrina, what's your tag? It's at Sabrina Gale. There we go. As simple as that. So um, please post your photos. We'd love to see. OK, so Sabrina, here we go. Um, why don't you give us just a little overview of the five dishes that we're cooking this evening? Sure. So um, I put this menu together quite carefully because I wanted a nice reflection of lots of different flavors, techniques. We love something a little bit sharp. We love something a little bit sweet. We love something a little bit savory. Mm. Kind of have a palate for a wide range of flavors and hopefully I've captured that as best as I can in the most balanced sense because we are chronic overfeeders. So <laughs> I, had to, I had to be curbed in order to put this wonderful combination together for you today. So we have... Um, 
um, a lovely selection of dishes and the first one are green beans with tahini but what really makes them special is these stunning preserved lemons. Now they're a tradition actually of North Africa but pickling and preserving mm. is a huge business for us in the Middle East and also here in England as well and these sharp little slices just really lift the dish and make it super delicious. Now we're going to follow that with the dessert, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just because it's prepped and it's out the way. Now, I know that some of you might be going, oh, I've seen the picture and I'm so nervous. I promise you, I'm also that girl. And the kind of desserts I put together are big, they're bold in flavor, but they are really sort of simple to put together. And this is a glorious combination of lots of really Middle Eastern flavors with pistachio and rose, figs, lovely crunchy milfoy, and it's a cinch to put together. Mm. Then we're going to move to the next dish, which is our spiced frique with chickpeas, a little bit of yogurt and some crispy fried onions. Frique is a lovely grain. It's actually a young green wheat. It's super delicious. It's got three times the fiber of ordinary wheat and it's a wonderful carrier for the flavors that we've packed into there today. Really delicious side to the next dish, which is our okra and fish stew. Wonderfully aromatic and flavorful and super simple to finish and enjoy. And lastly, we have a special dish, a Turkish dish called Ali Nazik, which is spiced steak. Now here I'm using beef. Mm. It's going to be on a bed of labne. It's going to be delicately spiced, but also has this really quite simple, delicious, butter sauce with a mild pulbe bear, which is a soft chili, and it's sensational. Now we're talking. Yes. Wow. <laughs> well, my mouth is watering, and um, well, what an array of fabulous ingredients, too. Well, um, we better get started, don't we? <clears throat> we should, yeah. So the, the green beans with tahini are up. Right, so I've got my ingredients here. I've got the green beans. Now I'll have everything just as you're going to have them. So fear not. Uh, I've got a little pan on the boil over here and I'm simply going to pop the green beans straight into the pan. Ideally cook them for about eight to 10 minutes. What I will tell you is if you like your green beans cooked a little bit more or a little bit less, just gauge it by tasting it and follow your instinct. I like them cooked through. I don't like too much of a crunch, but still not too soft. So I'm just going to pop them into the water here. There we go. And then whilst they are doing their thing, I'm going to quickly show you how to make the little dressing that I have. I've got a bowl here. <clears throat> I've got a teaspoon. And I have this little pot of tahini. Now, we've got this pot of tahini, and tahini is a sesame paste. It's just essentially sesame seeds that are ground down. So it needs a little bit of salt to season it. The good news is we don't have to salt this dish because we have these babies in this form here. We've got preserved lemons, and because they come packed in salt, which then becomes water, it's got all the seasoning and flavor that you need. So mm. I'm gonna take couple of these out <clears throat> and you can enjoy the rest of these. So I've got this little jar here that I'm going to, or this little tub here that I'm going to open. In we go. We've done the prep for you but what I like to do is just make sure that it's at the right consistency by thinning it down just a tiny bit. Now it's pretty spot on to be mm -hmm. fair but just a teeny bit. So it's that little bit of little bit of lukewarm water yeah. because the interesting thing about tahini is if you go it at it with cold water or hot water it seizes and solidifies yeah. so it has to be sort of lukewarm yeah. and then that's just the perfect you can just see it it doesn't seize it's it's I don't know what kind of crazy chemical reaction it is but it happens very it's quickly so yes I've made that mistake so you don't have to <laughs> right so that's fine then I've got the pine nuts. I'm just going to keep them to one side and I'm just going to use knife here. Now, just going to cut them into half. You can do this however you want to. The biggest thing to remember when it comes to using these is they do have seeds and picking small ones over big ones isn't necessarily a gauge as to how many seeds are inside them. I wouldn't sweat it so much because we're not Michelin star dining here. Just take out what you can see safely. And then, quite frankly, if you're ready to just slice them, the other seeds will just come out. Okay, so just going to quickly slice them nice and thinly. You do not have to work this quickly if you don't feel comfortable. And you can finally chop them if you prefer, okay? They're just going to be 
really pretty and also add bags of flavour and season all the green beans really. Mm. So obviously the green beans are going to take some time to cook so whilst they're doing that we can kind of move on to the next recipe but making sure that all our prep is at least done. Yeah. So where did you, where, where, where did your sort of love of cookery um, begin? Um, well, I grew up here, so I was I'm giving my age away slightly. Oh. <laughs> um, I was watching uh, TV in the 80s, watching yeah. Mada Jeffrey and Ken, Ken Hom cook, and I was completely entranced by yeah. what they were doing. And obviously we had Delia as well, but for me, the lots of little dishes and lots of different flavors, kind of almost shown here, is how I grew up eating. Yeah. So I was just couldn't stop watching them, and I... I was a self-taught cook because my family are, they don't cook. Not yeah. that they're not great cooks, they don't cook at they all. They don't cook at all. No, okay. no, basically. They really went out there on a limb. Yeah, so it's a, a very, very different ball game. So what I'm going to do is I've just slid the preserved lemons and the pine nuts aside, and I've got my dressing here, which I'm just going to put down here. That's fine. Okay, I'm just going to take you back to here, take a quick note. How's that coming along? Yep, that's doing its thing. Not going to worry about that. What I am going to do is just quickly move us on to yep. the next recipe. So if you're ready, we're going to do the fig milfoy and yes, tackle yes, yes, that yes, yes. beauty okay. of a dessert. And I'm going to pass you the plate if I can find the right one. It's a white one, I think. Oh, oh no, it's no, that no, one. It's this one here. <laughs> Thank um. you. Beautiful. So. Now, um, I know a lot of people are a little bit pastry phobic, but we've done all the work for you here. And we have two pieces of pastry, which we're going to layer with the various fillings. Thank you very much. This is your, what they call the mise en place. Uh, right? Yes, yeah. Okay. I'm glad I'm being of some use. Po posh term for prep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got two pieces, three pieces, sorry. Right, we've got three pieces of this pastry. Now, if you notice, one of them is coated in sugar. So we're going to keep that for the top because it has the nice glossy sugar coating. So we can put that to one side and put the second piece to one side for now, okay? Now, you've got your pastry here. Um, what I am going to need to do is I've got some fresh mint here and it's an idea to shred that now and get that prep ready because then everything's ready. Fresh mint along with some figs that we have. Mm. Now, I know that you guys are quite generous because how do you half a mint store? <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. So uh, we have more than enough here. And I'm going to give you a geeky little tip. It's actually quite chefy, and oh, I'm, we like, I'm, we like I'm quite. Chef I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a home cook, so when I do yeah. pick up a geeky chefy tip, I want everybody to know about it. So you take these leaves and you kind of roll them up. It just kind of makes for a really, really pretty uh, ribbon-like. Um, way of slicing them, okay? So, and then it just looks nice. That's looks brilliant. a bit different. Yeah, I'm so it kind of. slice mint any other way. <laughs> you've seen, I'd love to say you've seen it here first, but clearly you haven't. <laughs> I, I really so, haven't. <laughs> like, so, also, just keeping an eye on the beans. Don't worry, because like you can't really overcook the beans no. per se, so I wouldn't sweat it. It's just nice while you're doing this to just keep an eye on it. I don't want to distract you so much that you're not paying attention to what's there. So we also have some figs that have been packed for you, purely because figs are so delicate. We don't want to put them in together. Mm. Uh, we want to keep them so they're not bruised and they come to you in perfect condition. Okay, just want to take the stalk off because nobody wants to eat the stalk. So I'm very good at, yeah, thank you. I, I was just, you're I, lovely. I just had a dart in and- uh, Honestly, you could teach my off. husband a lesson or two, I tell you. Right, take the stalks off and just and pop them aside. I mean, beautiful. They are, and you know, it's okay. It's not always super feasible to sort of have figs, but they're so Middle Eastern for us, That's you know, it. we're just yeah. Middle Eastern, Greek, Turkish, you know, it's just really, really lovely, both savory and sweet mm. combinations. So just thinly slice them as best you can. The truth is that not, not so thin that they don't come out whole, but the more slices you manage to safely get out without losing a finger, because that's the truth, um, the more you have to distribute in between the layers, and you're going to be creating two layers of filling in between three sheets of pastry. So cut them thinly, be a little bit diligent to do that, and then you'll have plenty to go. 
And that's uh, you're doing a sort of a, it's a few millimetres, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. It's like, let's say you probably get about six slices out there, but don't sweat it. You're making this for yourself, so there is no correct answer. And that's the thing about food from the Middle East. There is no one way to do it. You do it however you were raised or whatever feels good to you. And, you know, and I think when something is like that, you don't really sweat it. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Right, now, back to the beans. I think the beans are done now, so I'm okay. going to take them off the heat. Let me bring this over here for you. Thank you. I'm just going to drain them off and then... Now, if you're at home, you can obviously just turn the tap on and let the water run just for a little bit in cold water. But we've got some ice to really shock it and stop it cooking. But first, I'm going to drain it off, OK? There we go. And then plunge it straight into here. And some people actually like to just dress it while it's warm. It's entirely up to you. It won't really affect the tahini. It's still really lovely. So if you want to dress it while it's hot, that's, that's fine. But it is a salad, so I'm going to follow it that way. You choose however you like to do it. Now, figs are done. Mint is done. I'm just going to take this pastry. Now, the trick is you don't want to do it too finely, but you don't want to do it too much up the middle because otherwise you're going to get a lot of pastry squirting its, its way out. Mm. So okay. it's sort of a centimetre-ish, isn't it? She hopes. Yeah, <laughs> and so we're going to really test everyone's piping skills at home, yeah. aren't we? Listen, I don't have the world's best piping skills. The truth is, if you're at home and you're thinking, oh God, I just can't do it that way, it's not a problem. Don't stress. You can either just do it in strips or stripes if you prefer. I'm trying to make it look as nice as possible. So if you fancy the fact that somebody else has done it for you, if you fancy being a bit fancy, then, you know, we can work on that together, okay? So I'll put my issues aside and, and, and be fancy with you, okay? So there is no way to do it. And... Okay. Ooh, the good thing about this is it's packed full of flavour. I was going to ask, what's, what, what, what is the flavour in there? So it's got cream, mm, uh, obviously, whipped cream, it but it, it, you know what really makes it, and it's a little bit obscure because it's actually not very Middle Eastern, is passion fruit. Because ah. it's got like a honey cream in it, it needs a little bit of acidity to cut through the other flavours. See, my piping bag skills giving me away. Just bring it down and just, you can actually do it fairly quickly, to be fair. That's it, you've got to get in the rhythm. You've got to, you've got to be confident and move. Yeah. <laughs> you need some confident and move beats. really quickly. There That's you go. It. Right. Wonderful. And you've got loads left over. So if you just think that you have to divide this into two portions, if you want to go heavy <laughs> on this layer or on the next layer, do. Or well, I mean, quite frankly, I'd probably eat that myself and <laughs> off camera, obviously. Um, OK, so now it's just a matter of assembling these as best you can, however you like. I kind of divide the two so then I have one fig that I know is allocated to one layer and the other to the other. So I like And you're like using this. all the fig. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Nothing to waste. Mm. This is one of those um, dishes that just photographs so well. So we're looking forward <laughs> to see what you guys manage to do at home. But it's, I mean, in your cookbook, it is just beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's it's like, Whoa. And I, I'd like to say that I, that's because I have great stylists and whatnot, but I'm no. really pedantic about not doing something that doesn't reflect the reality of it. And okay. the reality is I'm not the world's best pastry chef. So the desserts and puddings I, come, I put together I have to be, mm. this is probably the most complicated and it's not complicated. Mm. Um, but it is what I call a wonderful mess because it's all very well making something to look super beautiful. Promise you, the minute you cut into it, it's like a building site. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A wonderful, delicious, edible building site. Okay, so we've got a little bit of honey, which I'm going to save for the top, mm -hmm. but in between. Some lovely pistachio. Yeah, and don't worry about what I call pistachio rubble in the background because it just, you know, it looks very pretty, the finished dish. I, I think it is really a, kind of a beautiful mess. Yeah. Oh, I can eat in mess. What a beautiful well, dessert, and it's a mess. Well, it's a, yeah, it's a Middle Eastern mess. Yeah. <laughs> right, so I'll leave that, and then... This would be something great to just a home, few. dinner party. Yeah. Wow your guests. It's, it's really, really good, because all the components can be made. Now, That's on right. this level, I'm not going to do too many, because I want to save some of these gorgeous, oh, little... so aromatic, these rose petals. I can aromatic immediately smell petals. them. They are just stunning. Okay. Gosh, that's... And then a little bit of like mint. My grandmother's soap drawer. Oh. Charlie! 
<laughs> it's beautiful aromatic it rose petals. In a very, very good way. That when she combined loved with. <laughs> so just to be back to my childhood. It is a little bit of a familiar scent. I do, I do <laughs> understand that. But you know what? When you combine it with certain ingredients, it has really, really beautiful sort of heady notes that kind of transport you. Yeah. You clearly to your granny's dresser, but um, other people perhaps elsewhere to the exotic regions of the Middle East, okay? So, right, next layer. Right. Careful construction, almost right. Lego-like. Right, going to test the piping yeah. now, isn't it? Yeah, sort of Jenga I'm going to go a little bit heavier piping. now because I think, yeah. why not? I know how much cream I've got. Yeah. Now I'm just going to be brazen and just almost pipe it in a line. But, yeah. you know... This is where you pass the piping bag to me and say, right, you'll go. No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I'm a doer. I like doing. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> it is quite satisfying. It's more satisfying when somebody else has done all the work, I won't yeah. lie. There I wonder how high you could go. I mean, there's a thought, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, but it's yeah. it's one of those things that it could do, and obviously the book version is, you know, a, quite a lot wider. Yes. But it's, so it's a far more of a tragedy when you cut into that and it just goes. <laughs> but uh, I like this kind of portion that's perfect for a, a couple of people. Perfect. All right, we've got the figs, and yeah. again, lay them however you want to. You don't have to follow the way I've done it. You just do it however feels good to you. Yeah. Don't pick up a preserved lemon by mistake. No. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be too bad. There are lots of sweet things to balance it out, but it would yeah. just be one of those, oh, um, not Hello. a fig. <laughs> yeah. There you go. And save a little bit of the pistachios. We've kind of gone a little bit extra for you with the pistachios because who doesn't like pistachios? They're amazing. Um, but save a little bit on top because that's where the most sort of the top layer of prettiness is. So here is for okay. flavor. And then on the top is, you so. know, the extra. Appearance. Save that extra ten percent yeah. of excellence <laughs> for the for the final layer. A little sprinkling of the rose petals, and a little mint. bit more mint. So even with my slapdash way, it still looks yeah. really pretty. Now we're doing this. I mean, you know, sort of an hour in advance of eating, let's say. Yeah. But how, how far ahead of time could you get this prepared? So you can prepare all the components ahead mm. of time. You can definitely prepare the pastry from the day before, get it all sugar coated, no worries. But I wouldn't put the cream onto the pastry because, you know, it's going to absorb it yes. and it will soften the crunch and take that out of it. So I would just assemble it last minute. But again, if you've got everything ready, just like we have here ready for you, then, you know, it's a few minutes of work, oh, really. Isn't? Yes, absolutely. I actually feel like if you've got any of the spare, in the spirit of using things up, stick an extra layer. Because I hate not using things up. And you won't be sorry because it's yummy. That kind of answers what to do with the rest of that. It does. There we go. Right. I may have added some extra calories to that, but hey, why not? Live every day. Gosh. Okay, <clears throat> perfect. Now... We're going to sprinkle on, and this is where you can get messy on your plate, and it looks really, really pretty. Mm. Okay. Go for it. That's it. Yeah, go to town. Yeah. <laughs> and then pistachios. Feel free to reserve some for snacking, because I also find that that's quite a good idea. <laughs> yeah, edge off. No harm in that. <laughs> and then a little extra on top. Right. Lovely. Um, now, before the mint, I'm going to just from a high height, because it just means you'll get a thinner stream. A little bit of honey would just give you an added sheen. And doing it from a high height will mean you'll get a thin stream instead of a blob. Yeah, that makes so much sense. I'm going to okay. try that with my porridge. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Otherwise, you go heavy with the honey. Yeah, it's going to dollop. And then a little bit of mint again, just adds that little fresh flourish. And, oop, all stuck there. There we go. We have our lovely little dessert. And if you have any extra pistachios, mm, I just think it's just never a bad it, idea. Yeah. Just get it all over the place. Well, I mean, I... Obviously, unless you're allergic to nuts, in which case, don't. <laughs> like, be careful. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's it. Well, that's it. Cook along done. That's not so bad, is yeah. it? Right. See you later. That's Thanks it, very much. I'll it's been real. Um, <laughs> yes. So, carefully entrust someone... <laughs> 
<laughs> Very steady hands. Yeah. So it, you just got to be careful when you're moving it around. You don't want to lose all your wonderful effort, let's be honest. So just be careful when transporting it. Move these aside. Now, what I'm going to do is just quickly strain this off, if that's okay. Yes, you can kindly can do, do that for me. You. And then back in that same bowl, I'm just going to quickly dress that and add all the bits and pieces to it. And then that's two dishes done. Thank you. Lovely. So I've got back on the board with my preserved lemons and I've got my pine nuts here and I've got some pepper. Now, notice I'm not going to season with salt because it just doesn't need it, okay? It's got the salt is exactly what the preserved lemons do for that recipe. So, but a little bit pepper is absolutely delicious, okay? Lovely. Now, I'm gonna use my dressing here. Where is the dressing? Oh, over here. <laughs> Going to okay. use my dressing here, thank you. Just get it onto That's the, the tahini, beans. Isn't it? That, that be is tahini. the tahini, a little flavour of garlic. Yep. It's just lovely. Tahini is such a great flavour base. It's so good for intensifying soups and stews, especially oh, really? if you're vegan, because yeah. uh, it adds a creamy depth and richness. So sometimes when there's an absence of meat and you don't get that broth quantity, tahini does it beautifully. So does peanut butter, but tahini is very much sort of really our equivalent of peanut butter, but obviously a key ingredient to hummus and baba yeah. ganoush and things like that. So it has a wonderful depth of flavor that is hard to get with, um, you know, hard to get the similar similarities in any other product, but it does need help, it needs seasoning. So uh, we're gonna do that beautifully with the preserved lemons. Okay, now you can, if you'd like to, just dump the preserved lemons in here. Quite frankly, if I was at home, I'd be doing that. But in the interest of showing you <laughs> how to plate up something that looks a little more uh, visually appealing, shall we say, um, I'm just going to do that and stub the preserved lemons into the dish, okay? So simply coating it, nothing more than that. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to do this by hand because actually this is literally the best way because then you can arrange it in a nice way. And she says. She, well, I mean, when pre presenting and plating, are there any sort of any, any sort of rules, guidance, thoughts in sort of Middle Eastern ways? Yeah, so it's really interesting you say that because we have a tendency to present food either piled high in a mountain shape. This is about abundance, so think yeah. you're dealing with huge portions. Yes. So everything is either shaped a mountain shape or served on wide big platters or even the small plates like when you have a mezere you can see that sometimes it'll be like an aubergine dip or a yogurt it'd be spread out it's because it was always about abundance and there's a real emphasis on entertaining and hosting and cooking for other people and anyone that's not considered somebody that lives under your roof is a guest it doesn't matter if they're a blood relative you really pull out all the stops within your mm. capacity of you know budget and you really spoil them so we like to for people to have that little wow factor and have lots of little dishes on the table for tasting. They don't have to be super fancy, mm. but they, it's colorful, visual. There's a yogurt, a salad, a meat, a rice, that kind of vibe, shall mm. we say. So that's a, that's a, that's I kind a... of like that sort of, that yeah. they take that level of care, but you know, I'm, I'm still learning and <laughs> But it does often mean that I make huge portions of everything. Well, that's all right. There's always yeah, tomorrow, there's <laughs> exactly. But that's a nice tip also for you know everyone at home because you know I'm sure we're, everyone's quite on vogue at the moment to have sort of sharing plates. Yeah. You know, yes. And, yeah. Um, absolutely. You know, it's good to know that you you should go abundant in a sort of a mountainous. I think so. Way or or, or spread so. it wide. And I also think when you're cooking at home, it's so much easier and more cost effective to stretch something that little bit further and plan it for one, mm. two, three meals. You know, it's very much how we are in the Middle East. You know, I, I always knew that if there was a big pot of something on the stove, like that's what I'm going to be eating for the next three days, yeah. you know, sort of. Um, so it, 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 it's cost effective and, you know, it's very humble food. There's not sort of fancy pants or expensive ingredients because all the best food traditions come from poverty, hunger, you know, times where something became popular because that's what people had to eat and pr pr pickles and mm. preserves and things like mm. that. So I can understand it. And I think, yeah, go big. And moreover, all these dishes, if you were just cooking the full recipe at home, they keep really well, apart from the fig milfoy. Yeah. So you can make a tub of this and, and have something to sort of go to, you know, a little bit later on. And I kind of like that. Can I quickly remove yes, my hands? Yes, of course you can. That's okay, thank you. Not at all. Lovely. 
now because that tahini is thinned down you definitely have a hope of getting it off your hands really quickly yeah. <laughs> okay now just a little sprinkle of pepper now what i like about pepper is not only is it a seasoning but it also makes things look very pretty yes <laughs> so i kind of treat it more as a, a key spice really and then you have lots and lots of these pine nuts which i really love lovely 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 so that's that's it. Two dishes completed. Oh, yeah, nice well done, and easy. Absolutely delicious. And full of flavour as well. Wonderful. Importantly. That's the salad done. Happy days. Right. Great. So, we move on to the next recipe. Now, this is the carb. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, very talking. important. Yes. Okay. So, what we've got is this lovely spiced tomato and chickpea frike pilaf. What is frike pilaf? So, Frike is basically a young green wheat that's harvested early. So it's normal wheat that's harvested early and it's green. And because it's harvested young, it has three times the amount of fiber that older wheat does. Uh -huh. um, it has a very distinct grassy smell when you're cooking it, when you're boiling it initially. But it's very, very popular in the Arab Middle East and North Africa. It is really, really delicious. Quite nutty texture, quite similar to brown rice, a little bit more robust, um, but just a wonderful carrier of flavor, which is why I've sort of chucked loads of spice and also tomato and chickpeas at it. And I'm just going to take the tub and I'm going to heat that up. But what we do have is we also have a little bit of parsley. Yep. We have a little tub of yogurt because we put yogurt on everything. Okay. It's very much a balancing out for us. And then we have some crispy fried onions, which mm. have been lovingly done for us. So, so I've just got a pan here and I'm going to turn the pan onto kind of medium to high heat. Medium if you're going to cook gas because we don't want to torch this yeah. but we do want to heat it up quickly and if you put something on a high temperature and you move it around a lot then it's going to cook at a high temperature but it will heat up much faster as long as you're moving it okay so I'm going to get a little spatula here and turn this up that's it and it's packed full of flavor and actually that little tub when you turn it out it's actually Quite a lot. Quite a yes, lot. it is. And yeah. You talk about the flavour. What flavours do we have in there? What's, so it, what's the impact? Really? I, I always pick heady spices. I have yeah. a, a selection of spices that are always very much go to for me. That's cumin, cinnamon, ground coriander. I sometimes like a pinch of like a chilli heat, mm. but here there's a lot of t there's tomato, there's chickpeas. So it's really quite a meal in itself. And and for us in the Middle East, a lot of regions of the Middle East eat a lot more vegetables with occasional meat. Yes. So this is the kind of thing with a bit of yogurt and caramelized onions, you quite happily just eat by itself. You can do. Um, and to be honest, minus the yogurt, it, it could be vegan. So it's really quite a substantial meal. But because our stew here in this instance today is fish, I thought it'd be a really nice pairing with that. And because it doesn't have chili heat in it, again, a nice match for the okra stew. So uh. you can hear it sizzling. Now, when something sizzles, that's when you want to keep it moving to make sure, yeah, and then you immediately, immediately mm, get that scent in. of spices. And you know, that's the common misconception with the Middle East. Everybody goes, oh, you know, if I, if, for example, if I ask people what one word describes the flavors of the Middle East, you know, nine times out of 10, spice yeah. is what people respond. The truth is Persians absolutely don't use spice at all other than saffron, yeah. um, are very much citrus and herbs. So region to region, country to country, and sometimes even different parts of the countries, wildly different. So it's not all aggressive. There's not really that much mm. chili. Chili really is in its element in North African cuisine. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, actually, because I think sometimes, I mean, you know, I'm guilty of this. There can be blurred lines between Middle Eastern cuisine and North African. And I'm thinking sort of Moroccan. Yeah, and I haven't done anything to help that, I'll, I'll be honest, because <laughs> okay. I do, I mix a lot of my ingredients. But that's okay. I mean, Absolutely. And... I think, I think it is okay as long as you're not claiming, you know, fish and chips to be Moroccan, for example, yes. as long as you are being factual yeah. and respectful, yeah. then it, it's all good. And but are there any key differences? Um, there are key differences, yeah. but for example, uh, in ancient times and the times of the Silk Roads and Persian mm. Empire, you know, a lot of our influences are now embedded in, for example, Moroccan 
Indian cuisine. You know, they're great tagine clay pots. The combination of meat and fruit is very Persian. They'll tell you that. We don't have that dish, but they do have that dish. And it was because apricots would be traded, pistachios would be traded, and a lot of, like, you know, uh, dried plums, so prunes would be traded. And a lot of those ingredients embed themselves into a particular culture, and then they make their own dishes. And biryanis of India, yeah. you know, embedded in Mughal culture and heritage because they had Persian cooks because you know, it was terribly chic to have Persian cooks and courtiers and, and you know, language teachers and whatnot once mm. upon a time. So along with that came that rice method that's very Persian, but of course they created biryani in, in yeah. you know, the Mughal Empire. So, so it is really interesting and very, very diverse and there are little hints of Persian ingredients that, and other ingredients that similarly have come back into Persia, like tamarind, which means taste of India, tamar hind. So it's not Persian, but we do have it in some of our dishes. Okay, so that's that's hot. That's hot, I can hear <laughs> that's it. That's all yeah. you need to know. Yeah. And you know, this is also a really, really lovely dish if you wanted to serve it at uh, room temperature or a little bit warm, it's entirely up to you. My point being, absolutely don't sweat it, okay? Okay. So, so yes. Plate. Lovely. Now, again, in that true style, if we were doing this in a banquet style, we'd pile it high. I can imagine it. Uh, huge, literally long, huge yeah. rectangular trays. But today what we're going to do is do it in a flat style and spread it out. You know, not, not, I'm not going to stress too much about how pretty it looks because food in its natural state is beautiful in itself. So oh. just going to spread it out because it just gives that um, wider surface area. It's all about the caramelized onions of fried onions. To be honest, I'm obsessed with fried onions and we are, we do have an unhealthy obsession with them in the East. So, um, so we've got a little bit of parsley here. Now, parsley is probably one of the most common used herbs. Um, Persians actually, I would say we use more herbs, ourselves and Georgians probably use more herbs than any of the other Middle Eastern countries mm. um, because Persians use dill, parsley, we use everything apart from the woody herbs like rosemary, thyme and uh, sort of some oregano really, um, but we love the fresh soft herbs, um, but parsley is very much like tabula and uh, you know a lot yeah, of the of Middle Eastern dishes. Yes. So you can use the stalks if you like, they're packed full of flavour, great for stocks and stews, so if you want to discard them just freeze them they're really really delicious and a great addition to other dishes but for here we just want the leaves today and just chop them as best you can if you want a chopping technique technique best way to do is do it easy is keep your fingers out of the way just move your blade around nice and simple mm. okay you have a different technique for every herb <laughs> yeah, I do. Well, <laughs> it doesn't matter. My, my ethos is get it on the plate. <laughs> I want to know what you <laughs> By, by hook deal. or by hook. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay, then you've got the yogurt. Give it a little bit of stir because sometimes you'll have natural liquid from the yogurt sitting on the top. That's fine. Just mix it. Don't tip it out. Okay, what we're going to do is this yogurt is going to contrast and complement the spices so well. So everything in the Middle Eastern region is well thought out. If something has spice or is spicy, there's usually something to cool it down and complement it. And that's really what the yogurt is doing. We're just going to put little dollops of it all over the place. I think it looks really pretty, but also if you're serving it, you know, you sweep your cutlery through it some stage and you're bound to get a little sort of flavor of yogurt here and there and I kind of really like that there you go lovely and then a little bit parsley you know you can always I'm entranced by this <laughs> it's just quite naturally pretty it really is use them all like don't hold back because there's quite a generous amount because it's so delicious. So it's quite simple, but essentially it's all these components that are well thought out and make something so delicious and give you textures and sweet flavor on top of spicing. Sugars, especially a nice contrast and complementer of spice. So here we have it, another one done. That looks <laughs> so good. So I... that's the uh, Frika Pilaf, that's ready and boxed away. You might not get this one back. Well, 
I'll, I'll have to fight for it, but okay. it is what it is. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So, so we're going to move on to the next recipe. Now, that recipe is going to be the stew element, which is the uh, fish and okra. So we've got our beautiful piece of cod. Now, quite a simple process, really, because all the legwork has been done for you. Now, this isn't the most taxing. Of <laughs> no. Well, we're trying to think of, we want, we're thinking about your enjoyment here. Well, you know, if you were going to make these from scratch, mm. yeah, it would, it would require time, not necessarily complicated, but I think moreover, people yeah. are frightened of cooking okra. And then we have okra here, right over here, these long, exactly. So they mm -hmm. come in all various sizes, but I think as Westerners, and I, and I obviously grew up in England, so mm. I think if you're not from an okra eating culture, you can be a little bit frightened because quite frankly, there, are, there is a tendency with okra that if you cut it, it leaches out a particular liquid that can make them quite slimy. However, that just doesn't happen in Middle Eastern recipes because they understand there's one thing you need to know about okra. If you cut it, it's more likely to leach out that particular slimy liquid. But also, if you constantly stir it in a pan, constantly, it will also do the same. Whereas if you stir it occasionally, it keeps this lovely, slightly crisp exterior, not like crunchy crisp, and then has the most beautiful texture. And I love okra, and I think it's really underrated, but I do understand why people are nervous of cooking it. Yeah. And don't it's, really want I'm, to eat it. Uh, I'm so pleased I've heard that because all I ever hear is okra, oh, I don't like it, it's a bit slimy. Yeah. And it's all just down to people cooking it wrong. It, it is, it's just, but it's, I wouldn't say it's wrong, it's just in some cultures that's how you do it. Right. So I can understand. The one thing I'll tell you is uh, fries, potato fries, yeah. If you've ever had okra fries, you'll never go back to potato. They are incredible. Indians do okra fries and they are amazing. Well, you'll so, have to come back and show yeah, that, Well, you? yeah. So here we have the okra stew. Now it's, it's aromatic mm -hmm. stew that has okra, tomato, and a real blend of spices in there, the gentle heat. Okay, so what we're going to do is get a pan on and we're gonna put the okra straight into that pan. Again, limiting how much you stir. That's really important because okay. I want to give you every tip for the success of it, really. Shine Thank you. Yes, way that's way very kind you. of you. Thank you yeah. very much. Gosh, well, I'm never usually this lucky to I have somebody it's like you. Very calming in the kitchen. <laughs> going, it's very zen. We're going at a lovely sort of measured pace. Uh, well, it's there. not always like that, so enjoy it. <laughs> we haven't got to the steak yet. I am uh, at home like everybody else. <laughs> Eager to play. I can, up no, and but sit I can imagine you uh, cooking at home. I, uh, you know, I can imagine you being a very sort of methodical and tidy, tidy cook. Absolutely not. I'm. No, I couldn't be any side. further from the truth. What I, what I will tell you is, I absolutely absolutely love cooking and I think that if you have to panic about being tidy and cleaning up in a whole that Life takes the short. love out of it oh, okay. so dishes are left for the next day if I'm going to cook a feast I'm going to throw all my energy into making people happy right Good. so to the fish right it's up to you how you cut this, but essentially you want to try and get pieces that are roughly the same size. The one joy about this particular stew is that because it's ready to go, it's cooked and it's perfect, we're just gonna bring it up to temperature heat wise. Mm -hmm. Now you want to do this on a medium to high heat if you're doing electric, but if you're using gas, again, medium, because you don't want to lose all that liquid. But the brilliant thing about today is once you cut the fish and the stew is hot, you're going to place the raw pieces of fish on the surface of the stew, spoon over a little bit of liquid and that's it. You're not gonna stir it, you're gonna clamp a lid on and then just gonna turn it off. And whilst we assemble the last dish, this will cook in time. So it's about manipulating timings to suit you based on what you've got left to do, okay? So you can see you've got the fish, you've got the bigger fillet on this side and this smaller fillet. And sometimes if you look at the smaller fillet, it looks like it's going to come off because that's a natural join. So just make life easy and just cut it off, that's fine. And make that into two bits. And then if you cut this way, you can emulate roughly that size and they're quite similar, okay? And that's really your only job is to kind of make things be roughly the same size. And then it just means that they cook evenly and you've got this perfectly tender, delicious fish, okay? So just gonna leave that here. Yep. Give my hands a quick rinse yep, if that's do. okay. Thank and you I very can, much. I can hear the, um, the, the yeah. skewers being to bubble. So what I can do is just tell you that 
You can. You don't even have to get a spatula in there exactly as you did, Charlie. Excellent. Oh, yes. Perfect. Oh, the model student. So, <laughs> yeah, you really are. So, not not just wonderfully entertaining, but also really handy in the kitchen. That's great. So you can just give it a gentle jiggle. Don't need to do anything more than that. If you want to use a utensil, I'm talking about just teasing it gently, not going hell for leather and stirring it because that's going to break up the okra and also release potentially over, over a longer period what can be those slimy texture on the inside. It has a wonderful texture. They've cooked it to perfection. So let's not mess with perfection and let's keep the job nice and simple, merely to reheat it. Okay. So that's happy doing its thing. And then once we, once we get that hot, which is just literally a matter of more seconds, yeah. The simple spoon and get a spoon, simple spooning of liquid over it will enable just a little of that hot liquid to cover the top of it. And then we just pop them on top, clamp the lid on. Yeah. And then when it's done, we can put the fish down and scoop the liquid That's over so it. Good. And it's just, fish doesn't take long to cook. It really doesn't. And you have wonderful, delicate pieces. Mm. Nothing to fear if you want to break down the fish or you accidentally broke down the fish. Cause of course, when it cooks, it might break down. Don't worry about it. It's still going to be delicious. Okay, so we can do really that now because it's sort of little nestled on top. Yes, and it's sort of bubbling away really nicely as well. So you can see it's hot in the pan. That's really the most important thing. Bubbles, but not so aggressively that you've lost moisture. And bear in mind, fish has a water content. Obviously, you know, like most things do. So that is going to add a little bit more liquid in there. So it's good that it's on a hot temperature, but it doesn't need to be searing. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. May I please give that to you to put you in may. the sink? Thank you. Got my spoon. Now, easiest way to do this is just to tilt, get some of that liquid, just carefully spoon it over. Don't worry too much. Give it a jiggle because that will also release new liquid. So it's a little sort of basting and then... It is. It just helps it get a head start of sort of cooking it basically. Yeah. You know, you just got to be careful because you don't want to break up any of the okra. Right, that's it. Heat off. Heat off. Heat off. Okay, and then lid on. Yeah, and actually, I can even slide it away, especially if it's electric, where it'll have residual heat. Mm. Sometimes it's better for you to slide it away because otherwise it will just keep cooking and then you might lose some liquid, which you don't really want to because you want that liquid to mix in with your free care and for it to be a delicious marriage of flavours. Oh, yes, please. Okay, I'm going to give you the rogue yeah, okra to put back. Lovely. Part of okay. Now. Last recipe. Yes, here we go. Might even be my favourite. Oh, okay. I'm a steak girl. Yes. Oh. Okay. Well, we had some so. delicious Lebanese wine on a little earlier. And, yeah, um, what a fantastic selection. I know. Tim was like, I mean, I tried it. It was absolutely delicious. <laughs> so those at home, this is your moment to get the red out. OK, so what I have here is got this beautiful steak now. I love, I just have to say this because this is a gorgeous sirloin steak. Now I love fat on a steak, mm. but I have asked them to cut this off because what we want to do is have beautiful cubes of lean meat okay. so that it's, that's what you're experiencing. But if at home you're adamant you want to keep, if you're making this at home in your own recipe, you're adamant you want to keep fat, of course you can. You can use any steak you like, but we want it to give you a sirloin. nice... It doesn't. No, no. We wanted to. We wanted to give you the best, basically. Um, so it has a little bit of marbling in it because obviously fillet is lovely, but has no fat in it. So it's a very different affair. So I've got here uh, some crispy fried onions, but these aren't the same as the frique ones. Mm. These are kind of the shop bought ones that you keep handy, um, and that's because it's sometimes nice to just layer flavors into into dishes with things that you have at home in the cupboard. So I also have this, this is called Pulba Bear. Now I'm just going to open it up if you can see it here. It's this wonderful soft Turkish chili flake, sometimes called Aleppo pepper. The joy about this is actually a lot milder than your average chili flakes that we buy in the supermarkets here, even though this is now in the supermarkets. <laughs> Happy days. And we're going to make this really decadent butter with this, which is quite a traditional thing in, in some Turkish kebabs that mm. you pour hot butter, hot foaming butter, usually quite plain. And it just is delicious with a bit of yogurt and the grilled meats. It's superb. 
You've got to watch your waistline on it, but you don't go to Turkey to watch your waistline, you know. And then we've got labne. Now, labne is a very Middle Eastern thing. It's a type of strained yogurt. Some people say it's a cheese. I think personally it falls into a yogurt mm -hmm. category, but it's it's very uh, it's a higher level of acid and salt. I think it's fabulous. But of course, you know, it's a kind of yogurt really. Um, and then we have this secret spice mix, which we're going to blend into the steak, which we'll cut into cubes, and a little bit of butter to add with the pulver bed chili flakes. So, first things first, open the lid for that. Now, get your steak. You want them in equal pieces. That's the best way for me to tell you. There are measurements in your recipes, but if you're struggling and don't have a sense of what one and a half inches or whatnot is, or a cubed inch is, just make sure you cut them at roughly the same size so that they cook at the same time. I find that with this beautifully shaped steak, the best way is to just cut right down the middle. Now, this might not be what I would sort of practice if I was going to do something professionally. I'm gonna get the extra parsley off there. Um, but what I do think it is, it certainly makes the process a little bit easier today, okay? And the key is to have a, a thick cut of steak, isn't it? Yeah, so a thick cut of steak yeah, because, equal size uh, cubes, yeah, yeah, equal size cubes as best you can. Don't sweat it. If you've got a smaller piece, you know that's going to cook faster. Mm. You just take it out the pan. It's, okay. You know, it's not, you're not doing service, so it's a, just, just relax and enjoy this, this box and this whole process is about enjoyment and we want you to enjoy it, okay? What I will say is I'm aiming to have this nice and rare. So if you don't like to do that, I'm gonna give you a little trick so you can understand when it's a little bit more cooked, okay? Pop your steak straight into a bowl. And then we've got all the flavors and everything you need right in here. <clears throat> And that's your secret spice. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, essentially, <laughs> it's not so secret, but yes, it's, uh, it's got everything you need for sort of flavor, really. And then, uh, you know, there's, you can immediately smell heady notes of cumin and cumin is really, can be overpowering. A lot of people are surprised at sometimes how much cumin I put in some of my recipes, but you just have to understand how spices work and how to balance them. And here they have butter and yogurt and herbs and other, you know, sweet onions. So. You can't go wrong, really, wow. okay? The one thing I would say is it's really kind of important that you get this temperature of the pan on super high, okay? okay. Now, if you're cooking with gas and you're cooking on a small hob, fine, full temperature. If you're cooking on a double hob, I'd just be a little bit extra careful, but for electric and induction, you want the highest temperature because this is a super quick cooking and then you're gonna let the meat rest, which is crucial for the juices to run back down into the meat, okay? So we've got that and we're gonna- How long would you, can you leave this to marinade for? Well, because it's a dry marinade, yeah. it's actually really, really good. But the truth is it's so bold, you really don't need to leave it for a long time. So there's marination for the sake of marination and then there's marination that is permeating the skin or, or the outer, uh, exterior of a meat to tenderize it. Long-term marination is really about tenderizing a meat, usually through mm. lactic acid like yogurt or some sort of citric acid, which you have to be careful the length of time in which you marinate if you're gonna use lemon. But for example, yogurt is a softer acid and it will break down the, the uh, texture of the meat. But for this, this is pretty low fat meat. Um, it doesn't really need too much. These are punchy spices and it takes minutes to cook. So you don't have to do it. You could just do it instantly it's like I'm doing now. Now, Sabrina, you've fallen into the hob trap. I can see a hob glowing. Oh, and dear. I think your pan <laughs> is on the other hob. Rookie, rookie. <laughs> Not the first share. <laughs> Thank there you very is. much for telling me that. Now I have well, to be careful that's with why that I handle. Stand here, you see, so yeah, I, I know. Keep an eye on things. Oh, and I fell into that one as well. Okay, right. <laughs> so now a little bit of olive oil, because they always say always oil your meat, mm -hmm. never oil your pan. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, I'm like, I find this, these bits really enjoyable and therapeutic. <laughs> kind of like that. Um, they also say there's nothing like the touch and temperature of a human body to marinate meat because our body temperatures immediately open up the pores mm. on whatever you touch. So, uh, well, on meat, for example. Yeah. So well, that's incredibly important when sort of kebab making, isn't it? The, yes. The Gosh, that's such a tradition of Middle East. And this is what it is, because interestingly enough, kebab means roast. It doesn't mean 
anything else. So anything you can kebab a tomato, you can kebab, you know, anything that's here on the table, really. Yeah. So it's a it's a real tradition that every region and every country has made its own. But the reason uh, the kebabs skewers our flat swords a lot of the time is because it was the Persian Empire soldiers that would go out as they were conquering and then at the end of the night once they were done conquering you know sort of kill a lamb somewhere and skewer it on their swords and they gave it the name kebab but obviously cooking meat on an open fire is a long-standing tradition so I'm just gonna quickly wash my hands yep. again thank you right I'd like to say we're pioneers but we only have two types of meat kebab and one chicken. <laughs> I think the Turks really have the monopoly on variety, diversity and flavour and I, I love, absolutely love Turkish kebabs which is kind of why I turned to this particular recipe for today to share with people. Okay, right, okay. So, now the simple way to know when your pan is hot is when it has that sort of a little bit of wave and smokiness mm. coming from it. Um, that's really what we want to sort of look for. Uh, I've got a pair of tongs here. Happy days when things go right, you've got the right kit. We're now, not short of utensils. No, I know. <laughs> it's a very well equipped kitchen, I cannot grumble. So the best way is to simply take a piece of meat. Can you hear a sizzle? That's, sizzle, sizzle. that's really what you're looking for, okay? Do not move the pan, do not jiggle the meat around, do not, heaven forbid, stir it. You're looking to sear this meat and char it as you would on a barbecue. And we're, that's why we do it at a super hot heat because essentially we want it to char on the outside and be nice and tender and juicy on the inside. So get all your meat in the pan. It's a job of doing things carefully rather than just chucking it in. I'm, I'm very slapdash everywhere, unless I don't, I shouldn't be, so, <laughs> lovely. Okay, I can kind of give you that, yeah. thank you. Now, with the meat, I also have a little resting tray, which is going to help me when I'm going to assemble the other parts of the dishes. Okay. Um, because you do want to let meat rest, as you would like a turkey or a Christmas roast or any roast, really. It just benefits because as the juices of the heat makes the juices in the meat rise you want them to go back down mm. and not be lost and also this will prevent the juices from running all over the yogurt when we come to assemble the dish so just you want a little bit of smoke it's really really important so if you've got extractors <laughs> or a window you know now's the time to do it we're lucky here because we have a big studio but um you know you do just want to sort of keep an eye on it and the only way i really move it is just carefully by lifting it look at that Oh. Perfect char. Yeah. You want to sort of get that kind of char all the way around. So, and because they're small bits of meat, you kind of want to move them around fairly quickly. Yeah. And just and do the them as best time, you can. Sort of toasting the, 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 the spices. Yeah, you are toasting the spices and really waking, waking them up. up. But at this temperature, you do run the risk if, let's say, you turned a blind eye to it and you weren't, you know, we weren't cooking together, yeah. then you do risk the, run the risk of burning the spices. Yeah. And you, you do also don't want to do that because burnt spices are bitter and become gritty, but not here because we know what we're doing and we are devoted yeah. to this one do, particular Do you always dish. need to do a sort of toast spice? Um, uh, there are many schools of thought. If you're going to toast spices, it's whole spices that you need to toast. Oh. Because whole spices contain uh, a lot of oil that is mm. unlocked because they're still whole. And the thought is that if you just gently heat them up, yes, of course you waken them up. And then when you do then grind them down, if that's what you choose mm. to do, you get a completely different story and a completely different flavour. No real point in toasting ground spices because their oils have been unlocked. Oh. So you know, like Asian culture will dictate that you really must use fresh spices when they're ground, and I understand that. The fresher, the better. Um, but, you know, I've been known to use some pretty dodgy spices for my own cooking at home because I, what I needed maybe was running out and it's all I had, so, yeah. you know. I, if you're doing it for yourself, who am I to judge? But yes, for my customers and, you know, when I'm teaching, of course, I want people to have the best that they can have, but essentially I still use supermarket produce because... Mm that's what people find. Your pop-ups are such a success. I mean, you must get asked the whole time, Sabrina, why not open a restaurant? 
Um, but I suppose, so, you, well, why not? Well, I, I don't know. The, the pop-ups are kind of how I made my name. Okay. But I don't think, and, and that was a, quite a long time ago. It was 11 years ago, and I only bought them back a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, so now, sorry, once you've seared them on a few sides, now you can just quickly Give toss them, them like that. Sorry, I'm just mm. going to quickly do yeah, this yeah. bit. For those of you who like your meat fully cooked, I'm going to give you a tip. When you touch the meat, can you see the meat is quite bouncy? Yeah? If it's bouncy, it's going to be nice and rare on the inside. Now, if you're looking to cook your meat a little bit more, it will need to be firmer to the touch. So if you like your meat a little bit better cooked, then keep going. Reduce the heat a little bit, but keep going, okay? But for us, I've kind of just like, you know, got the meat there, tossed it, it's sealed, and I'm just going to take it off temperature now and make sure I turn that off and just leave that to rest here, okay? Right. Because we want it to stop cooking and all those juices to flow back into it. Um, so the supper clubs are a real passion of mine and it is definitely how I made my name. Mm. But somewhere in the sort of like six, seven years in between, I got distracted doing lots of other things like writing books and whatnot. Um, and so I stopped, but it's really nice to sort of bring them back. But when I used to do them, when I started them, there were 12, 12 people in my living room. And now it's like 120 people at a venue. Yeah. So it's a, a very, very different ball game. But I worked in the restaurant industry for nearly 20 years before I even became a chef. And there's a lot to consider, and I, it's just not for me. I like the diversity of, of mm. uh, work rather than being tied to one business, which you do need to be tied yeah. and really focused on it. Yeah, but bad. here I'm, all I've done is taken that pan off the heat, okay? And if you're still cooking your meat, just remember this step and you can follow through. I've just taken a little bit of kitchen roll and I'm just wiping it. There's a good reason for that is because I'm actually going to make a spice butter and I want to use residual heat because I don't want the, bu the butter to turn into what we call burn noisette, hazelnut or brown butter. Um, I want it to just melt. So I'm going to go back to that when it's cooled down a little bit. But this is where the pull bear, the red chili flakes, and this lovely little thing come into play. So I can just do that just after mm. I put together a plate. Okay. If you can kindly me pass me the you? blue plate, that would be lovely. Oh, and the cod is just chilling out. God is just stay. happy. You don't even you need don't to. Even think that's about the it beautiful thing about it because it hasn't been immersed. Yeah. It's not going to become tough and overly firm. It's just sitting on there with a hint of liquid, essentially steam cooking. Yeah. Brilliant. It's, it's such Genius. an easy way to yeah. sort of serve. Now you've got your lab nair and we're going to have another spoon. Right. You can take as many spoons as you like. Yeah. <laughs> so just give the labneh a little bit of a stir because it will just make it easier for you to spread it out. Just do this as best as you can. Don't fret. Nothing about my cooking, as messy as it is, it all comes together and looks like it was intentionally beautiful <laughs> at the end of it. But I place emphasis on flavour. So that's really More what I want. Important flavour. Absolutely. So hold your plate and just spread it. It doesn't have to be a perfect circle, but you want to create a little mound of yogurt for the meat and also that lovely butter. I find if you rotate it a little bit, just do it however you like. doesn't matter if it doesn't look like a circle. Mine rarely does, but God knows I'm trying for you. <laughs> <laughs> I there think you're doing a great job. <clears throat> okay. Right, now, um, now I'm gonna go in with the pulver bear but I'm going to add the, the butter first. Butter to the pan. There we go, okay? Keep an eye on it, it's really, really important. And if you feel like, oh my God, it's burning, it's bubbling too much, just lift it and just do it here. In fact, I could just do it here yeah. because of the Why residual. Not? Yeah. Why not? But what I'm gonna tell you is wait until the butter is melted uh, before you put the pull bear in because it just, it prevents it from burning, especially if you still okay. got it on, on the same uh, hob. There you go. Okay. Now, another spatula. Mm -hmm. See, it is a well-equipped kitchen. This is my third one and I've still, no problem, no oh, equipment missing. Cool. Okay, now just quickly incorporate the butter. And as soon as the butter is melted, remove, right? Just keep it off the heat. Okay, look at that. Just look at the color of it. It becomes this like super hot, bubbling, orangey red butter. And it has this 
slightly, almost citric, almost lemony, slightly bitter vibe about mm. it, but it's not mind-blowingly spicy. So again, everything in balance and the yogurt, of course, is really cooling. I'm so excited by seeing this all to come together right. and I'm just imagining the sirloin on there and the butter being there. drizzled on top. I'm going to keep Crispy shallots. One. Right, now mm. there is one ingredient dill. here. You're going to show us dill. a way to <laughs> chop dill now. <laughs> there is a, um, I don't know, I always used to say dill is not just for Christmas and salmon, it's for life <laughs> because we, we just love, we kind of bring out the dill really for fish, don't we? Yeah. In this country. I grew up and dill was, you know, there's like vac pack packets of cod and whatnot. It's a yeah. very 80s thing if you're born after that. Lucky you. Um, so I, I just think it's underrated, but however, it can really be pungent if you're using it on, of course, delicate white fish without other ingredients. So yeah. I do understand why people are a bit like, ooh, dill. Very easy on it. Yeah, just it's here. Not everyone's taste, is it? No, it, it doesn't. I, let's say I've converted a lot of people who say, oh, I don't like this and I don't like that. Mushroom haters, aubergine haters, mm. because I, and even okra haters, because, you know, I'm like, well, there is this other way that you could try it, trust me. And then they're like, oh my God, that's so different. And I'm like, well, it's either what it's paired with or it's how it's cooked. So, but there is sometimes, coriander haters are the worst because they, there's no converting them. No. Nah. Oh, right. <laughs> and I understand it. It's yeah, genetic. I get it. No, I'm missing out on, but it is genetic. Right. Okay. So now you can see, you can see the meat juices are running out. It's kind of better than it run, runs into the pan than onto your yogurt. But I, what I will tell you is, once these have rested for the few minutes that they have, you need to work quickly, okay? Because you want the butter to stay hot and the meat too. So simply take the meat. Just shake off any excess moisture. Don't worry if a little bit of the juices spill. So what? It's going to taste fantastic. Mm. Will you do anything with those juices? or? Um, I mean, off camera, I'd probably drink them. <laughs> um, well, you can pour it over there if you if like. You like. That's, that's entirely up to you. I think if I was presenting the dish to you in a restaurant, of course, I wouldn't because no, I want it to look maybe as... Maybe at home. Maybe at home. Yeah, you'd find probably a teaspoon. Probably at home. Yeah. Definitely at home. Um, I don't like wasting food, and I, I like things to be generous and look beautiful, but more importantly, taste delicious. So yeah, it's. Uh, I'm with you. I'm packing the meat in here. Lovely. Excellent. Okay, Good now. Time. Be careful. If you, like me, are using a metal pan and a nonstick. A you know, metal spoon in a nonstick pan. Just use the bottom of it, which is the rounded bit, and then just here, scrape to the end, and then you're not damaging or do, you know making scratches on the pan. Okay, mm. just mix it a little bit, and then, you know, liberal. Yeah, <laughs> like, liberally, liberal. Liberal. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so you, you do get sort of some folk are quite territorial about their pans. And yeah, well, I am. Stick pan. I am. I don't let anybody wash my favourite pans. I'm super, oh, really? super particular. Yeah, you've got to take care of Your things. Your husband must be happy with that. No, don't wash the pans. No. Well, we have a dishwasher, but no, oh. he knows the crack, and he, he definitely, he's a very diligent, lovely he's person. I can't. Well. <laughs> yeah, he knows because I'm like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> he knows it's not worth angering the beast. <laughs> and then you've got these crispy onions, sometimes they're shallots, it doesn't matter because here they are crunch and flavour and sweetness against the spice and that juicy meat when you bite into it. I always find these are really handy for soups and just like even in sandwiches yeah. I pile them in. And then got that lovely bit of dill and there we have it. God, look at that Sabrina, wow. We've got our wow, wow, wow. Ali Nazik ready which is spiced beef with labne and a pulbebe butter. Great. We're done. We're done. Well done. <laughs> Thank well, you very much. let's get all of this together so we can see all these incredible dishes together. Um, let me ooh, lean over here and create some space. Um, that's it. Let me take that for you. Thank you. If you, um, if we pop that over here and I'll shimmy the chopping board out of the way. Lovely. Thank you. Sort of piling things up. Beautiful. Oh, in come the freaky. There we go. Now this is very customarily how we would eat. Lots yeah. of little dishes. It's not about having, you know, three vats of everything. We just love lots of little flavors. You might have some bread, you might push the bread through something, or you, you know, kind of have a little bite of everything. Ultimately, oh, we've got one more dish Ultimately, as well that we have to serve. we're missing the cord. <laughs>
just before we completely forget that. <laughs> now, what I do want to show you is, look at that. Perfect consistency of sauce. It has a richness and you see the cod is cooked because it's opaque. Mm. You know, there's no worries with fish because it's going to tell you, like prawns, they change color. Fish changes to completely opaque and that's how you know it's cooked and if you want to further test well you can just flake it and give everything a little little stir which is what I'm going to do what I'm going to do also is it's a little kinder if you work with a bigger spoon because then you can scoop out the long okra uh, in a kind fashion without breaking them I might break them it doesn't matter okay all right so I'm going to take out you can start off by plating the cod and the okra mm -hmm. and build the dish and then pour the sauce over it. So get the shape or whatever you feel happy with presentation wise done first. There we go. But you're right, you do need to be quite delicate, don't you? You do need to be quite delicate. Sauce. It's a little bit more <laughs> little forgiving. Bit it's a little bit more forgiving than perhaps, you know, I am I, telling you. But I think if I tell you to be careful, then you've got a better chance of enjoying the dish and then knowing in future use, you know, how you can sort of deviate yeah, from that. That's it. Lovely. There we go. Well done. Okay. So there we go. Quite the feast. What a Middle Eastern feast. No wonder you've <laughs> written a cookbook called Feasts. Go on, Sabrina, for the final time, tell us what do we have here? Okay, we have the first dish that we did, which is the green bean salad with tahini dressing and preserved lemons. We have the gorgeous fig milfoy with a passion fruit, honey cream, pistachios and rose petals, and a little bit of mint on top. We have the free care tomato and chickpea pilaf with yogurt and crispy fried onions. We have the cod and okra stew. And then lastly, we have the Ali Nazak spiced beef fried in spices with a delicious pulbebe butter on labne. Sabrina, thank you so much. I have so Pleasure. enjoyed having this experience of sort of being your sidekick for the last <laughs> hour. It's been wonderful. And thank you for letting us into this sort of magical world of Middle Eastern cuisine. Thank it's you been, very, very much for having life. me. And I so much. really hope everybody at home enjoys these uh, as much as I enjoyed cooking them for you. Well, I'm sure they all will. And please, guys at home, take photographs. Come on, let's share those with us um, on, on Instagram so we can see the incredible creations. So, um, that's it. And that's it for this series of A Cook's Tour. I just want to say a quick few thank yous. Thank you to our chefs. Of course, we have Sabrina Gayor, but we've had four preceding her. We had the wonderful John Chantasarak, we've had Anna Hall, Tristan Welch, and of course, Ben Tish. I'd also like to say a big thank you to our drinks partners who have been uh, serving cocktails with Johan Svensson and our wine partners too. I'd like to thank very quickly, the team here at Event Concept in the studio who've been utterly fantastic, um, but also, of course, the team at Rocket, the backbone to a Cook's Tour. They've been superb in delivering this winter series, so thank you so much to them. And the final thank you is to everyone at home. Thank you so much for joining us, for supporting us. We hugely appreciate it. We've had a blast, and we really sincerely hope that you've had a good time too. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you.